Amen. Thank you, worship team. Uh, if you do have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to our psalm that we're looking at this morning. And there we go. All right, little head this morning, aren't I? We're just going to jump right into this thing. Psalm chapter, or Psalm 1, um, and this is the seventh most popular psalm on our countdown in the top ten, right? Uh, I need to get my radio voice better than that, but I'll work on that next week. Uh, so <clears throat> seven, uh, psalm number one, we're going to be talking about, we're going to look at this psalm, one of my favorite psalms, maybe one of yours. Hopefully by the end of today, it will be one of your favorite psalms. It is the lead psalm that starts the entire Psalter, the whole 150 psalms there. And so it starts the idea of, of uh, worshiping, um, and, and this is, remember this is a worship book, so the very first thing that they wanted to be reminded of in worship is this psalm. And so uh, we're going to look at it from the standpoint of a little bit different standpoint this morning. We're going to look at it from the standpoint of leadership this morning, from leadership. Now, if, uh, if you haven't turned there, go ahead and turn to Psalm chapter 1, and as you're doing this, uh, I, I want to kind of retell a story that I read this week, um, a remarkable story about Captain, uh, Army Captain Kevin Mott, and he uh, graduated from West Point. He was deployed at Operation Enduring Freedom. He was, uh, while on deployment, he was engaged in a battle. He was shot in the head. He fell down a 400-foot ridge, uh, uh, ridge line on the mountain. He falls all the way down there. He breaks just about everything that you could possibly break on and in and on your body. He broke it. It even had uh, uh, his... Um, I know this sounds kind of gross, but it's, you know, it makes the story, I think. He even had uh, most of his scalp ripped uh, off, okay? So severe brain injury. He goes through rehab. Six months after rehab, he is redeployed, and he goes back to his platoon, and his words to <clears throat> uh, his, uh, his, his uh, commanding officer was, I'll clean the bathrooms as if that's all that you'll give me to do. Um, so they gave him a platoon to lead. He leads this platoon into the heart of enemy territory in Afghanistan. They engage in a nine-day epic battle. He uh, acts heroically and ends up uh, being awarded the Silver Cross um, medal for that. Now, <clears throat> that's, to me, a leader. Somebody who had every right to say, okay, I've done my part. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to go back doing what I want to do now. But that's not what a leader does, right? A leader does what he or she has call, been called to do. Captain Mott <clears throat> became the leader that West Point had meant for him to be. Now, we think of leaders in, in roles like that or uh, as someone who uh, uh, has a lot of people that they are in charge of or uh, whatever it may be. But do you view yourself as a leader? Do you think of yourself as a leader? In John Maxwell's book, uh, Leadership 101, he boils all of leadership down to one small, simple principle. Leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. And, and I believe he's, he's right in that. If you boil everything down about leadership, it's the fact that it's about influencing, influencing someone else to do or to think or to follow where you are going. All of us influence somebody from the CEO of the Fortune 500 company to the stay-at-home mom. Every one of us have people in our lives that we influence. We're all called actually by God to be influencers and leaders within our culture, particularly servant leaders, servant influencers. I mean, think about Jesus' command, his great commission to go and make disciples. That implies you, are, you and I are going to lead others to him. We are going to teach them. We are going to baptize them. We are going to help them learn how to grow spiritually in their new relationship with Christ. All of us have been called by God as Christians to influence others for the kingdom of God. But what we instead see in today's culture, especially on social media, is not this type of influencing. It's what I guess I like to call armchair experts. <laughs> Everybody's got a professional opinion about something. Who knew we had so many epidemiologists in this nation, right? But you go to social media and everybody's an expert on anything now. Everything. Look. God didn't call the church to be armchair experts. He called us to be leaders in this culture. And leaders lead out in truth. That's what we're going to see in this text this morning. 
is that this text is all about, if you want to be a godly leader to influence for God's kingdom in this culture, then there are three or or four uh, realities or truths or qualities that have to be evident in our life for that to happen. I want you to listen to Psalm 1, and then we're just going to go line by line with it. Psalm 1, blessed is the man, or generally person, uh, blessed is the man who does not walk or walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the, uh, stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So if you want to be a godly leader in an ungodly culture to influence ungodly people to follow our great God, Quality number one of our leadership is found in this verse one, is that a godly leader has to separate himself or herself from ungodly influences. We have to separate ourselves from ungodly influences. Look at verse one. He says, blessed is the man or the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. You can see the progression there without even me having to point it out, right? One time he's uh, listening, now walking there, he's standing, now he's sitting. Well, ungodly or godly leaders surround themselves with godly influences and not ungodly ones. There's three characteristics that he, he just throws out real quick here about who godly leaders are and who they allow uh, to influence them. Uh, the first one here is they don't walk in the counsel of the wicked. A godly leader refuses to listen to ungodly counsel. A godly leader refuses to listen to ungodly counsel. Walking in the counsel of the wicked, what that means is listening to the advice of ungodly people thereby allowing it to affect your thinking and then your behavior. See, the thing is, we as followers of Jesus, this is authority in our life. Not what Fox, CNN, or anybody else has to say about this. This is our authority. We do not take spiritual advice from unspiritual people. We do not take biblical advice from unbiblical people. We have to watch who we're listening to. But not only that, but the godly leader also refuses to be associated with ungodly lifestyles. He says, nor stands in the way of sinners. To stand in the way of sinners means to be closely associated uh, with them in their thinking and with their sinful behavior, to be aligned with them. Uh, We shouldn't be aligned with people that do not have this as their firm foundation right? Uh, And the best way that we see this is, uh, unfortunately, we've had too many denominations in our uh, culture flip-flop on some very basic Christian Orthodox evangelical teachings. Homosexuality, right? Abortion. We cannot allow ourselves to be influenced away from God's Word. The godly leader uh, refuses to associate or to be associated with ungodly lifestyles. We have to stand for justice, truth, and the gospel. But then we see that uh, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. A godly uh, leader refuses to be identified now with ungodly people. To sit and dwell here, uh, or to sit here means to dwell or abide with or in. So the scoffers that it's talking about, that's somebody who's proud, who's arrogant, who uh, kind of um, loves conflict, they reject all God's wisdom and, and, and God's correction. They don't want to have anything to do with God. And they want to gather everybody else to mock at that kind of lifestyle and to scoff at, at that kind of thinking. And to sit with such people is the end of that progression. They've, you've began to listen to them. Now you've began to walk with them and do some of those things. And now you are part of them sitting with them trying to do the same thing to other people. That really just means their thinking has now become your thinking, their behavior has now become yours, and their pride and arrogance has now become yours as well. 
But the issue here is Romans 12, 2, Paul says, do not conform, be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed, don't be molded into, by the influences that ungodly culture is trying to mold you into. The culture is trying to mold you into its image. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That means that, that we are not to follow the ways of the world, right? We're not to think the same way. We don't have the same mind. We have the mind of Christ. We don't have the same heart. We are a new creation, a new creature. The world is built around greed and pride, but we are built around love. Our motivation is the glory of God. That is different than the world. The world is trying to shape us into its image, no matter who you are in here. That's what your friends, and that's what social media, and that's what everybody else around you is trying to shape you into, is their own image. But God is wanting to transform us from the inside out. It's the very reason Jesus came and Jesus died, according to Galatians 1.4, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Jesus came to rescue us from our self, sin, and Satan. And the challenge that we face on a daily basis is, are we going to influence others toward the kingdom of God by the way in which we lead them, or are we gonna be influenced you know, away from the kingdom of God? by allowing them to influence our thinking and our behavior and what we identify with. I mean, Jesus did this, right? We're, we're supposed to be uh, uh, just as Jesus was in his, uh, in, in his ministry, <clears throat> but Jesus was never, excuse me, <clears throat> Jesus was never influenced by those around him. Instead, he used his influence to, to open up the gospel to all those around us, and he's calling us to do the same thing. So we have to separate ourselves from ungodly influences. Let me move on, because uh, this is going to be really long if I've only got through verse one. So number, number two, uh, verse two, uh, a godly leader saturates himself or herself with God's word. A godly leader saturates himself or herself with God's word, but his delight, but, so instead of allowing God, ungodly influences to, to, to do this in our life, but his delight is found where? Uh, in the law of the Lord, the Bible. We would call that the Bible. And, and on his law, he meditates day and night. Meditates is, to, it literally means to recite quietly. What this is, is a picture of somebody that loves, that takes pleasure in learning and studying God's word. They love God's word. They see it is of the highest value in their life. They're not just a preacher. They're not just a seminarian. They're not just a, a biblical scholar. They're not just the best Sunday school teacher in the nation. They love God's word because of its value of, in, in how it operates in their life. And the same would be true for us if we remember, I believe, why we should value the Bible so much. I taught this to our our college group uh, Tuesday night in our uh, Bible study, um, and it's a very easy uh, acronym that you can remember if you want to write this down, whether you're here in person or at home. Uh, it's S-C-A-N, SCAN, okay? And this is why the Bible is so important, why it has so much value, okay? So S, the Bible is sufficient, right? It is sufficient for our faith, for who we are, understanding who we are, understanding who God is. It's, uh, it's sufficient in helping us to obey God. Um, in fact, P, uh, uh, Paul writes that in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse uh, 16 and 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, or the person of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the Bible is sufficient for our, our practice of life, for where we are heading. You will not go wrong when you read the Bible and you give your time and you invest in the Bible because as you read the Bible, you begin to find out, wow, I'm not so much reading the Bible as the Bible is now reading me because <laughs> it's really shining light in my life that I didn't know there were some dark spots there. And so it's sufficient, but the C there, it is clear. It, it, it means clarity. God is not a God of confusion. He did not write the book of Revelation to give you the hibby-jibbies and fear and anxiety and figure out how he can trick you. It's the revelation. It's to reveal truth, right? Now, we're, we, we're looking at maybe doing Revelation uh, maybe in the next series, so maybe that's a little teaser for you. But, but the whole point of the Bible is that it's clear. God wrote it clear. Now, 
is it easy to understand? No. But it does not mean you cannot understand it. It means that you have to depend on God for understanding, His Spirit to guide you into all truth, and you have to submit in humility to what He's teaching you if you're going to continue to press into His Word. But it is clear if you will cultivate that ground. So it's, it's clear. It's also, A, is authoritative, that the Bible is God's Word. It is breathed out by God. That means it is God's very spoken Word. It may have been written down by these gentlemen over a period of 1,500 years, and they were using their own personalities and all of that, but make no mistake, this is God's divine utterance. It is His very Word. So when we even read Psalm 1, that's not me reading that to you. That's not the psalmist who wrote that. That's God himself speaking now. It is authoritative in our life. But in is that it's necessary. God's word is necessary. Now, in Romans 1, 19 and 20, we see that, you know, you don't have to be in church. You don't have to grow up in a Christian home. You don't even have to have the Bible to know that you can go outside and look that, hey, there's creation and no one is without excuse because we can see that there is a creation and there is a creator there. But uh, the Bible is not necessary for, uh, to understand that there's a creation or to know about God, but it is necessary to know God. Romans 10, 17. I mean, how are we supposed to, quote, get saved unless we hear the word of Christ and believe, right? So we have to have the Bible because the Bible is the gospel in print. It is God's spoken word about the good news of Jesus Christ. And that leads us to salvation. And so S-C-A-N, the Bible is sufficient. It's clear, authoritative, necessary. Now, so uh, when we're thinking about this saturating himself with God's word, there's a principle at work here. Um, I was at a church member's house. I'll, I'll leave that person nameless um, because I don't want y'all going to sneaking over into his garden late at night and picking all of his good stuff. But he had a ton of, uh, I mean, there was like hundreds of tomatoes and, and thousands of peppers. I know I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you get it. It's just a big garden and it's just producing all kinds of stuff. And as I walked into this garden yesterday, I, I thought about my garden. I've got a few buckets on my back porch. <laughs> They're not doing real well. <laughs> I don't even know when the last time they've had water other than, you know, because you would think, well, of course, Brother David, they have, have water. Look at all the rain. No, I have them under the, uh, under the side of the house where it doesn't really get water. So there you go. So one has buckets and is not producing a lot. The other is out there, I mean, producing something that Walmart would, you know, call to say, hey, we need some vegetables or whatever. There's a principle at play here is that the farmer or gardener who knows a lot typically grows a lot, right? Well, I don't really know that much, so I'm not really growing that much. Well, the same is true for your spiritual life and my spiritual growth as well. Because the more that we grow or the more that we know, the more that we spend time in God's Word, guess what? Typically, the more that you're going to grow. Growth does not come by activity in God's kingdom. You can be as busy as a termite in this church, and all that you have to show for it is what a termite may do. Growth comes by one way, God's Word. Spend time in God's Word. I can guarantee you spiritual biblical leaders are Bible readers. They spend time with God's Word. If you want to lead your family better, spend time in God's Word. If you want to be a, a more uh, influencer around you in your office or at the, the workplace, spend time in God's Word. God says His Word will not return void. Amen? So God wants us to be those kinds of leaders. All right, I'm running out of time. Let me fly through some of these. Number three, godly leader sets himself, herself up for success. A godly leader sets himself or herself up for success. So look at verse 3 and 4. What we see here are three different characteristics of the godly leader and then the implied, verse 4, uh, three characteristics of uh, an ungodly leader. Uh, and in, in verse 3, we, he says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water. 
So the first thing we see is that a godly leader is permanently rooted. That God takes this person when he's saved and he plants him. That's what Isaiah 63, 1 says, that we are oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. That God takes us and he plants us. And these, these plants here are planted by streams of water. The, plant, the word plant there is the word rooted. So we're rooted by streams of water. And these streams of water are not what we think of streams in Mississippi. They're not just little one-off streams here or there. No, these are irrigation channels, these irrigation canals that are connected to the large rivers of Egypt and in Palestine. So that means that water will never run dry. It will always be there. There's always fresh water coming into it. And the most important part of the plant is what? The root system. You never see it, but it's what draws up the nourishment for the rest of the plant. The same is true for us. As we spend time in God's word and those roots grow deep, we are drawing upon the grace of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And those roots go deeper and it makes the plant stronger. It makes our spiritual growth that much more stronger. But they're permanently rooted but they're also productive, that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. It, mean, it mentions two things here, fruit real quick and green leaves. There won't always be fruit on the vine, will there? Even in gardening, there won't always be fruit. The fruit will come in season and out of season, but what you want is the green leaves because you know that there's water getting to it. It's not dying, it's a healthy plant. Well, the same thing's true for you and me as we are connecting to Christ, as we're spending time with him, we won't always produce fruit. And fruit, by the way, in the New Testament Christian's life is the, the character transformation that means that when people look at us, we look a lot like Jesus because he's changing us from the inside out. That's the fruit. But that won't always happen. But the faith of, or the emblems of our faith are these green leaves because as we continue to spend time in God's word, our faith is still strong. We may not be producing fruit that day or in that season, but our faith remains intact. It's still there because then God will eventually produce fruit in us. And we know that he does that, John 15, 5. Um, but then the godly leader is also prosperous. And all that he does, uh, he prospers. That means to be useful to God, to glorify God through our life and through our lips. John 15, 8, Jesus talking about the fruit and the vine and all this. He says, by this, my father is glorified. And here's what the this is, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So the, just the fact that we are rooted in, in, in endless streams of water and that God is going to produce fruit and keep our faith intact, God can use that to glorify himself through your life, no matter how old you are, no matter where you work, whether it's in a home or whether it's in an office an office building somewhere. God wants to use our life to lead others, to influence them toward him so that he could be glorified in them as well. And then the, the flip side of this is just as true. Verse four, the wicked are not so, they're like chaff that the wind drives away. So we would say of the ungodly, uh, the wicked here, they are rootless, fruitless, and useless. They have no stability. They have no fruit for the kingdom because they can't and they are useless in God's kingdom, which means they're useless in eternal perspective. So that's where this is and the whole idea that, that what we're getting at with, you can either set yourself up by the, the streams of living water that Jesus is and spend time with Jesus and connect with Jesus and daily uh, be encouraged in his word, or you don't have to. God's not gonna put a gun to our head and make us do Bible study, does he? He doesn't do that. that. That responsibility is on you and me. But when we do it, we find success and because we find spiritual growth in it. If we don't do it, then when times get tough and the wind starts to blow, we may, our roots may not be very deep at that time. So we want to set ourselves up for success. And the last part here is a godly leader sees what is most important. He sees or she sees what's most important. Verse five and six. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So as different as these two people are, the outcomes or their destinies or where they end up at the end is just as different. 
It says the wicked uh, will not be part of God's people. It will end in judgment will, where they will perish. Okay? We call that eternal punishment, a place called hell. This is what this is leading to. Um, and if you, this idea or this image may help you to understand that <clears throat> the, the ungodly, the wicked, the rebellious person, they think they're headed to Las Vegas, but they're really just headed down a dead-end street. It, it will never pan out. It will never bring the satisfaction and joy and, and exuberance that they're seeking after. This lifestyle and this kind of leading in the culture will always be a dead end street. But God offers us something so much better. He offers us the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, right? That, that the, way, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. This, the word, this word knows here in the Old Testament is really about this grace-based relationship. God knows who they are. He knows them by name. He protects them. He provides for them. He walks with them. He, he makes them productive. He loves them. He cares for them. This is the relationship that the godly person has with their Lord. In Stephen Covey's uh, uh, famous book, most of you have probably read this or at least seen it, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. What's habit number two? Anybody know? Begin with the end in mind, right? Begin with a leader has to know where they're going before they can just set out to get there, right? The same is true of a sculptor. A sculptor doesn't see a big block of marble and just start chipping away and, and then, oh, wow, look, look what I'm making. No, they see the block of marble. From the first time they see the block of marble, they already say, hey, I've got an image in mind and I'm just going to chip away all those pieces that don't reflect that image. I'm going to do that. See, the point here is that the, the, that person has already got in their mind what the end outcome is going to be. See, as leaders in this culture, we have to lead with eternity in mind. We've been given the result of our leadership, of who we are in Christ. One will go away to everlasting uh, torment and punishment. One will go into everlasting life. Now think about leading with eternity in mind. How would it change the way that you lead your kids just by thinking about how is this going to pan out in eternity for them? Am I letting them just do whatever they want because that's easier? Am I, am I really intentionally trying to, to disciple them? Or how, how would leading with eternity in, in, eternity in mind change the, the way that you lead people under you at work? How would that change the kind of boss that you are, the kind of owner that you are, the kind of friend that you are, the kind of spouse that you are? How would that change who we are like that? Hopefully, we would be changing quite a bit, even in social media, right? That we would think, man, what does eternity in mind, how would that change the way I respond or influence somebody there? Godly leaders see what's most important. I want to end with a, a personal story. Um, I tell a lot of personal stories, I guess, but this one's kind of embarrassing, okay? So uh, <clears throat> I know it'll be on Facebook and all that. I get that. But I think you'll get the point. <clears throat> so so uh, the other day, um, I, I, and I'm 42, and I let me, let me set it up like this. I'm 42, right? And I've, I've done a lot of things and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and one of the things that I, I love doing is going to the gym. I love, that's just my hobby. It's what I do. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm always doing something different like that. Well, this is one of those days. All right. So Thursday night uh, over at uh, Clint uh, and Susanna's house, uh, they've been having the kids over, you know. And, um, and, of course, I've got my gym workout stuff on, and I'm about to go do cardio. And I drank this uh, supplement stuff that um, I had thrown together and, and, and dropped the kids off, went to the gym. I mean, I hit the Stairmaster, Stairmaster, whatever they call it now. And I mean, I was killing it, like 750 calories. I mean, I was blowing through it, you know, loved doing it. Got off, went to go pick them up, walked in the house now. They don't, they have, Clint and Susanna, uh, they have no idea I'm telling this or what they're even part of the story about. But I walk into their house and, and, I wasn't in there like a minute or two. I'm standing by the front door, uh, and, and all of a sudden, somebody's like, something smells. Like, like it really smells. 
And then Clint comes over and kind of close it. At first he's over by the kitchen. He's like, it really does smell. Something smells dead. You know, it's like, like bad. And then he walks over to me and he's like, it's not so much like right here or right here. It's like right here. And he's pointing toward me. And he's like, something's like dead. And then Susanna comes over and like, I smell it too. It's like right here. Something smells dead. Well, I didn't know. I was just, you know, like, come on, kids, let's go. We get in the car, drive home, walk in the house. And my wonderful, honest wife and kids said, dude, you stink. <laughs> you smell like a dead fish. That's how bad you smell. It was horrible. I had taken the supplement that I found out later that uh, one of the side effects is you smell like a dead fish. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> now as crazy and as funny as that may be at my expense, think about it in our leadership. Sometimes our leadership stinks and we don't even know it. Sometimes everybody around us, in your home, in your office, everybody else around you knows that your leadership and my leadership stinks, and we cannot see it. But Jesus does. And so through his word, and, and this, this, as his word begins to, we, we, we separate ourselves from these ungodly influences. We saturate ourselves with his word. Man, we, we, we see what's most important. We, we get close to Jesus so he can change us from the inside out. Then our leadership begins to not only smell better to the Lord Christ, but actually be useful in the kingdom of God. So I don't know where you are in your leadership scale or whatever uh, you are in that, or if you even feel like a leader. But God, if you know Jesus, he wants you to be a leader in this culture and at this time. People want truth. They're searching for it everywhere. Give them the truth and how you live and what you say. But you may not feel like a leader yet, and you may not even be a godly leader yet, and that's okay. Because Jesus died to take your sin, stinky, you know, uh, uh, sin-stained garments to the grave. And he wants to change that and give you a fresh new life. One, one that smells pleasing to him and not like a dead fish, right? So if you, want, if you don't have this relationship that's based on what Jesus has already done for you, then can I tell you, it, it, it's the most simple thing in the world. If you'll just recognize your sin turn from it, turn to God through believing in Jesus. Ask him to save you and to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. Then you have that new life according to God's authoritative word. And so if you don't know how to do that, or if you want a more information how to do that, you can go to the uh, little ticker on the uh, screen that you see that has our church website and the Yes to Jesus button. And I'd love to be able to help you out on how to start and continue a relationship with the Lord. For those of us who are in uh, person today, if there's a decision that you want to make, if you need to pray right where you are in just a few moments, Abby, you guys go ahead and come on up. Whatever it is, however God's leading and moving in your life, let God do that and be obedient to him. If you want to, I've been so blown away. We've had uh, more and more people joining uh, the, the fellowship and the faith family here um, and even through this pandemic. So if God's called you to unite with this church, then don't disobey, then obey God. Then, and what that looks like is just come find me afterwards and just like the rest of them did and we'll, we'll talk about it and kind of, you know, go through that whole process with you. Or if you feel like uh, you need to talk with someone about salvation, then we'll be up here um, after the service. But however God decides to lead, let's let him lead and be obedient. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the time you've given to us. We pray that you and you alone would have uh, the, the uh, uh, charge and the uh, freedom to work and how you want to work in the next few moments. And thank you for what you've already done. We look forward to, to worshiping and responding in, uh, in spirit and in truth this morning. And so we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.